the one thing that I ask for my dancers and collaborators each show is that we are present. Um, be present in who you are, how you are, um, and what you think you are. Um, I think that it's really important to do that when you are kind of um, being as vulnerable as we are asked to be as uh, people on a stage. When I'm thinking about a new creation, the process shifts according to maybe where I'm at with my life or what's happening in the world. Ironically, a lot of the works tend to come into um, some kind of thought process two years prior to them making the stage, and in some cases even four years out. I think the first day of rehearsal with the company is always different. Uh, I try not to repeat myself too often, which is really hard, especially when you know people will talk about, oh, you're developing a language, and you know if it's a language, then <laughs> the same words at some point need to be used. Um, but I try to find different ways to approach the work. The one thing that stayed a constant in a lot of the more recent works is um, a process that I developed uh, from studying with Neil Greenberg, who was one of my teachers in college. He taught me choreography and composition. In Neil's work, he uses a lot of um, improvisation where he's videotaping himself and the dancers might dissect that movement in some way. And I like to employ that in my process uh, as much as I can so that we can really get to each kind of finite detail of what I'm hoping to do with my body. Uh, my dancers in my mind are much more capable than I am. So. Oddly enough, I never thought I was going to be a dancer. I think um, starting at 17, I just immediately thought I was going to be a choreographer. Um, I made up dances in my room, like probably everyone here. Um, but for me, studying dance was a, a, a way of learning so many more different ways to move. And that's what got me to dance class, was to try and learn more about movement and have uh, allow me space to be able to move. You know, when you go to a school like Purchase, you know, we had teachers like Kevin Wynn, who's one of my biggest influences. Um, we study Jose Limon technique, we study Martha Graham, Merce Cunningham. I had a lot of my, my ballet training both in that last year of high school and into college was all mostly um, uh, balance sheet. And starting dance so late, I just loved movement and loved learning about movement. So that's why it becomes this kind of um, pot of gumbo. It's just all stirring up in there and it, it's all rooted in some ways when you bring in the word urban. Because, you know, I'm someone that grew up in a, a really urban environment, um, so hip-hop was heavily immersed in my experience growing up, um, but it was before it was kind of codified to uh, a kind of dance class. Um, so when we went out dancing, we might have been dancing to hip-hop music uh, and doing certain movements that were part of that experience, but that is just another way of looking at improvisation. So the, probably the, the rue of, of the work is probably based in that social dance um, component and then all of the, the elements that we're adding to it become the, the trainings of the Jose Limon, the Martha Grahams, the Cunninghams, the, yeah, the Trisha Browns, all that kind of stuff comes on, on top of that. The other thing that has to happen is we have to all own our um, kind of identify our perception of our percentage of privilege, right? Because everyone has some kind of privilege. Even me saying that I'm a black, gay, American man, each one of those things has a certain element of privilege that goes with it. And how we own those things, albeit on stage or in our personal life, it will kind of correlate, and it does, I feel like it does so for me in the work that I create and in working with my collaborators. These are conversations that we have when we're in process after performance, in a performance. The process of working with collaborators is a really kind of, again, complex one because I actually refer to my dancers as my fellow collaborators. We spend so much time together really talking about what we're doing and, and why we're doing it. But when I bring in maybe a visual artist or a musician or a dramaturg in some way, I am thinking about those collaborators in the earlier part of the work. And in some cases, it may be a point in the process where I say, you know, I actually need someone else's lens to really come in or someone else's voice to help this to really um, gel together in some way. When, when I was given the, the commission with New York Live Arts to be their resident commission artist, I um, presented them a series of ideas, one of them being creating a work inspired by Max Roach's We Insist Freedom Now Suite. Um, I'm a big jazz fan and have been my whole life. Um, but it was, at that time, we were getting close to what would have been just now the uh, 100, 150th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. So, um, trying to 
address the work that's looking at what's changed, what hasn't, how are we talking about the subject matter, and even diving even further into what that uh, Robert Chavin was addressing, was also looking at apartheid in South Africa, and of course the civil rights movement of that time period, um, and wanting to really expand upon the company's work um, and trying to really build um, a repertory, I decided to make two different programs. One, an evening length work, which was, uh, which was called The Watershed, uh, where Glenn uh, Ligon was one of my key collaborators along with my dancers as collaborators. Uh, and then a companion suite of works, which is what we were showing here this weekend, When the Wolves Came In. All four of those works were um, using the same subject matter, using that Max Roach album as a jumping off point, but trying to find different ways to approach the subject matter. Um, so when, you, when we go through this weekend's uh, program, you start first with the title work, uh, When the Wolves Came In, which to me is a, a work looking at perception. We see what we want to see, right? So um, there are moments in that dance where a uh, white man may be lifting a black woman. There's also moments when a black woman might be lifting a white man. But based on how we're seeing it, you may only um, really remember one of those two things happening. The, the work is actually set up in some ways in the reverse of how, we're, how, we, are, um, how we usually think about race in this country. Uh, the second work, um, Hallowed, is a trio that's set to, I should also say, I guess, uh, When the Wolves Came In is uh, set to um, the Los Angeles Massacral performing uh, Nico Muley's A Good Understanding. Um, the next work, the trio, Hallowed, uh, is a trio that's set to gospel hymns that were synonymous during the, the 60s and civil rights era. The, the work for me it has this bubbling up um, in it. It's a really subtle work, as I was saying earlier. Um, but for me, it's a, it's a work that is um, referencing this time when you, even if you saw someone that you knew um, that was lynched, you, you didn't want to react because if you reacted, then it, that may either mean you knew who, um, who was hanging the person that you knew and or loved, um, or you know, you're just fearful that you may meet that fate in some way. So there's a, a real, really subtle um, bubbling up of um, emotion throughout that work. Uh, and then the uh, third work is um, The Gettin', which actually uses that Max Roach score, but reinterpreted by one of my other key collaborators, Robert Glasper. Robert reimagined that um, that Roach score. Um, a lot of it keeps a lot of the essence of what that album was. We might have flipped some of the songs in different order. Uh, one one piece in particular, a, a duet that's in that program, also uses um, drum also waltzes, which is from a different Roach album. But I, I brought that in because before I knew what Robert was going to do, I knew that something about the essence of that song connected me with. Robert's vibe. So it just winds up staying in. It had a kind of coolness and a, a tension and a kind of underlying thing in it. But overall, the getting allows for the scream um, and um, physical shaking that Hallowed wasn't allowed to have. So that is primarily how this program comes together. It also um, involves a one of my key collaborators, Dan Skelly, who served as my lighting designer for the past 10 years. And he's really used light in a really um, interesting way, lighting and, and video collaborator in this project. Um, he's used both in a really exciting uh, and subtle way at times. Um, there are lights in Hallowed where you'll see a little, um, maybe a little piece of paper this big on each lamp, but those are actually images of people who were lynched or burned alive. You won't see them that close, but they're hanging from those lamps. Um, so he was really keyed in on the work when, when collaborating with us. I think it's a good thing for me to be reassessing what I want to be doing and how I want to be doing it. And that's one of the greater things, you know, I, I realized just last year, even though I'd already been into my second year of MacArthur, of I actually don't need to work with anyone that doesn't make me feel good in any capacity. Um, you know, sometimes we work with collaborators in, in all aspects of life, depend, doesn't matter if you're a choreographer or what have you, you could do any, any job, where you may work with someone because they're really good at their job, but they make you feel terrible about yourself. 
I don't have to work with those people anymore. Um, and that, that's something that was really important for me to, to own, that I don't have to do that. Um, I should be enjoying what I do. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.